how how is everybody i'm gr i'm so happy to be here i'm happy i wish we could be in person together but unfortunately the the, the pandemic is such that we have to do it this way and i and i'm looking forward to to talking to you i want to start today by discuss by 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 telling you about it about a trip i once took um to um uh, to a place called the the Mas, Man, Musandam Peninsula, uh, which is sometimes called the Arabian Fjords, and it's it's technically uh, a part of Oman. Um, you can see on that map there that that photo of the Earth is technically a part of Oman, but it's surrounded on all sides by the UAE, by the United Arab Emirates. And to give you a sense of it, if you look at look at the pictures there. It's about seven hundred square miles of glacier carved coast. It's where the Arabian tectonic plate rubs up against the Eurasian plate and it, and and that makes for a very uh, sort of bleak and beautiful uh, land landscape so I, I got there and I found someone to take us out on what's called a, a, the, the traditional Dow fishing boat and you can see the boat there at, at at the, the bottom. And the reason I, I did it was because I wanted to see a place called Telegraph Island. Telegraph Island is, is not much to look at, at least not today, um, unless you're snorkeling, then there's gorgeous fish and dolphins and uh, anemones, all, all, all the things you expect to see. But right now it's just a pile of rocks and an, old, and an old wall. But I was there because I was fascinated by the history of this little island. Um, once upon a time, this island was at the center of a technological revolution. Um, one of the famous British submarine telegraph lines was laid across the Persian Gulf and then on the other side the Gulf of Oman you can see it there in, in the picture and sort of imagine it and then there was a relay station which which linked the eastern part of the world with the western part of the world at least that's that's how they said it said it then and, and that by the way for those of you who don't understand the telegraph a relay station is where one one side of, of, of you know Morse code comes in, and you listen to it, you can write your notes down, and then you Morse code back out the 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 other the other side. This was the middle of the Victorian era, so all communication happened by more by Morse code. And this was this this little tiny island was the nexus of sort of a global worldview. It was the symbol of progress, the symbol of innovation, a symbol of the, the, the promise of human ingenuity. Um, unfortunately, everyone who was stationed there on Telegraph Island to receive these messages and send them and relay them went crazy. It's where the British term going round the bends come, comes from. It turns out the hot sun and the sense of isolation destroyed all the naval officers that, that were stationed there. They, they committed suicide, they went crazy. And, and, and the point here is that this was literally the world's most connected place. This was the place where humanity was more connected than any place else on the planet. And yet people were dangerously lonely when they were there. And there's a parable there, uh, but to make the moral of the story clear, I want to talk a bit about the telegraph in general. The telegraph was really the start of our hyper-connected world. Hyper is, a, is an ancient Greek word prefix that has to do with excess. It has to do with going beyond, above. We usually use the word hyper in terms of speed. So I want to talk about speed. The first message, and we can call it the first text message, right? Even though it's long before the SMS protocol, we can call it the first text message. And it was sent across the Atlantic Ocean by 18, in 1858 by, by, by this submarine wire. And it took 17 hours to send. It took 17 hours to travel from Queen Victoria in London to President James Buchanan in the United States. 17 hours. So it was blazing fast, right? <laughs> uh, any, the, the Queen, Queen Victoria wrote to the President of the United States, the Queen desires to congratulate the President upon the successful completion of this great international work in which the Queen has taken the deepest interest. The Queen is convinced that the President will join with her in fervently hoping that the electric cable, which now connects Great Britain, Britain with the United States will prove an additional link between nations whose friendship is founded upon their common interest and reciprocal esteem. Buchanan replied, well, it took 17 hours, so we'll have to wait for a moment. 
No, just 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 just, just kidding. Buchanan replied to Her Majesty Queen Victoria of Great Britain. The president cordially reciprocates the congratulations of Her Majesty the Queen on the success of the great international enterprise accomplished by the science, skill, and indomitable energy of the two countries. It is a triumph more glorious because far more uh, useful to mankind than was ever won by any conqueror on the field of battle. I won't read the whole thing, but I'll say I'll say the you know, notice the optimism that's in, that's, in this, that's in this message, right? And imagine what would have happened had Samuel Morse already thought of the, of the emoji, right? Um, you know, this, we are one, said the nations, and hand met hand in the thrill electric from land to land. This is a poem called The Victory. And at the time it was dedicated to Samuel Morse because people were sure the connection was going to eliminate all miscommunication, eliminate all confusion, and bring about a peaceful world, right? But instead, I think we all know it may have, it may be the thing that did the exact opposite, right? The 20th and 21st centuries have been the bloodiest, most destructive centuries in all of human history, right? 60 million people killed in the world wars, five to six million killed in the Russian civil wars, half a, at least half a million killed in the Spanish civil wars, Hitler, Stalin, Mao responsible for at least another 60 million deaths. It, you know, the, uh, the optimists were clearly a bit delusional. Um, similar delusions continue and they continued to happen along with all new technologies. I don't know how many of you remember are old enough here to remember Live Aid, the concert live, the, the concert live Aid. Um, uh, I watched it on television and I, and what I remember is it felt like a monumental moment of human global connection. It was like we were watching world peace happen on TV, um, but of course its, its impact was fleeting. It turns out that we were all fooled once again by something that I like to call the telegraph delusion, um, which seems to be pretty common, right? It seems to be pretty common that we make the assumption that exposure or connection will automatically lead to understanding, right? We believe that connection in itself leads to kindness and compassion. Uh, we have this sort of notion that encountering diversity is inherently a positive, uh, positive thing. Um, and, and that's because we believe in the fallacy that, 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 that's, that, I, that, I, that I term, it's not my term, but it is a, that, that has to do with the empathy altruism hypo hypothesis, right? This is the idea that empathy automatically leads to altru altruism. By the way, I should do a quick little history lesson about the idea of empathy, right? Empathy is actually an industrial era invention. The, the, the term, although it comes from an ancient, ancient Greek roots, it, the, the term wasn't even coined until 1909 in, 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 in Germany. Uh, the term in German was Einfühlung, which means feeling into. And at first it was about motor mimicry. It was about the, uh, the idea that we sort of imitate each other or even the idea that, you know, when you fall down, I say ow, right? Because I can imagine your, uh, your, 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 your pain. You know, it's kind of the thing we, we now talk about it in terms of, of, of mirror neurons. Um, anyway, the, the term empathy comes from a, a philosopher named Theodore Lips, uh, who wrote about empathy and art. He was curious about why art, why paintings, why sculptures, why they move us, right? How is it we can look at something that's not us, look at something that's over there and feel moved, right? Feel an emotional sensation. How, how, do, you make, make, how do you make sense of that? Um, it's only in recent years, actually, that empathy became equated with a kind of moral goodness that we started to say, you know, empathy is something we need to teach because it's inherently good. Um, th this notion that exposure and understanding will start to lead to, to compassion. But the truth is, if you look into the science of it, right, the jury is really still out on whether or not empathy is a good thing because we all feel, for example, more empathy for our loved ones or for those who we have a lot in common than we feel for those we don't have a lot in common for. That's sort of been proven. And also we've shown that, that the empathy can go the other way, right? Studies have shown that, for example, sports fans, football fans take pleasure from feeling into the, 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 the rival team's loss, right? You take, when you imagine the idea 
that the fan of your rival team is feeling sadness and you feel into their sadness, you empathize with their sadness, you feel good about that, right? So, so that kind of schadenfreude uh, no, notion um, it, it is, is at the heart of the idea that, that the empathy is not necessarily um, a, a, a good thing. Nevertheless, you hear the empathy altruism hypothesis in everything, right? You hear it in education. We talk about it. We talk about it. You hear it all the time in a lot of, you know, Silicon Valley tech marketing, right? They've tried to sell us on the, on the premise that more efficient communication automatically makes for stronger communities, automatically, uh, automatically creates peace, right? They've tried to convince us that by eliminating terrestrial limitations of connection, right? By allowing us to, to connect over land, we're able to find common tribes, right? Like minded others people people that we that we have things in common with well and what this is absolutely true on sometimes some of the time in some ways this is true for example my children play video games with people all over the world they talk to people all over the the world and we all know that people on the internet connect um you know, they'll bond over shared interests and hobbies. They find support groups for their mental health issues or, or, or just for, for other people who are going through the same things as them, right? There's so many stories about alienated, isolated people, people who are transgender, gay, people with eating disorders, people with depression, anxiety, victims of sexual violence, right? They, they, so many people have discovered that there are people like them everywhere and they found support groups on Reddit and on Facebook and on uh, uh, and, and videos on YouTube that actually have an enormous positive effect. But at the same time, of course, we do know that the same technology is what's allowed hate groups to find communities of like-minded people, right? It's allowed a sort of increase in tribalism and nationalism and misogyny and racism. And, and, and it becomes, you know, for on, on all sides of the spectrum, people are able to find things, uh, people like them. And so from a macro perspective, if we want to look at the big picture, we've all found ourselves living in something I like to call the winter net, right? Um, and, and I say that because we've learned that, that, that being exposed to diversity being exposed to so many different people without adequate preparation won't necessarily lead to a sort of warm and fuzzy orgy of empathy, right? Instead, it, 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 it leads, it, it's led to something sort of frigid and something cold and something that's full of conflict, right? Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, all the social media, right? right? Although they have the potential, it's often been used to just be a theater for insults and ad hominem attacks. Um, um, right, uh, you know, it's the, the, the internet is patrolled by armies of bots and trolls. Right, everywhere you look, there's bots and trolls, and and and, and that le and that's led to something. Well, I don't know if it led to it, but that that certainly is it's part of the reason that we have so much technophobia. Now, technophobia is as old as human ingenuity. I mean, we, we have to acknowledge this from the beginning. Techno, uh, technophobia goes all the way back to the beginning of, of, of human ingenuity. Uh, for example, the example I love to give over and over is that Socrates, pictured here, Socrates, um, was completely against writing. He never wrote anything down. He thought that writing, which was a new technology at the time, was going to be the death of civil society. Why did he think that? He thought that because it was going to hurt everyone's memory, right? So much of education in ancient Greece was about um, memory. It was about mnemonic tricks. It was about memory skills. And so they, they, it's one of the things they prioritize very, very, uh, very highly. So he was very worried that once we wrote things down, we wouldn't have to remember them because we could just do, we could just, you know, look them up every time we want. He was also, he also famously said that writing is like painting. It's deceptive. It appears to be there but you can't ever see the back of what's pictured. We can, like, for example, in this picture, we can't see the back of Socrates, uh, so Socrates head. Um, um, so, so, so it's sort of a, it's sort of a lie. Likewise, he said, written words, when you ask them what they mean, they just keep saying the same thing over and over. Socrates didn't believe that writing could ever communicate the depth and meaning and uh, uh, the depth and meaning and affective experience of a face-to-face -face in a face-to-face -face encounter, a person-to-person -person in, in encounter. And my guess is, if Socrates saw text messages today, 
He'd just say that it was the obvious outcome of humanity's regrettable move towards literacy, um, which is a shocking idea to us. But in many ways, he was right, right? Plato, Plato wrote Socrates' ideas down um, for him. Socrates refused to. And in my field, philosophy, we have just thousands of years of people arguing about what Socrates really, really meant. It turns out the words on the page were actually insufficient. Um, another example of, of technophobia is, is just the printing press, right? When the printing press happened, uh, people were sure that books were going to destroy all communal, communal, communal storytelling, right? Uh, they were sure that reading a book, sitting alone, reading a book in a cocoon of solitude was going to be a bad thing for people. People argued that the, that the pamphlets, which were printed at the time, uh, just because it started with pamphlets, and they argued that those pamphlets made it too easy to spread fake news. I, I'm not kidding. This is, these, are, these are actual things that were written at, at, at the time. They said that print printers were incentivized to print scandal, right? In the same way that we say uh, in the, that, that the web is incentivized to create polarizing things. They said the same thing when the printing press uh, um, happened. Um, you know, there, there, there was a whole moral panic around the echo chambers that happened after the, the, the printing press. And, it, and it's important, you know, and I put this quote up of, of, of just, you know, people saying that the, 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 the printing press is going to be the end of morality, that Pope had to get involved and, and fix it because nobody believed in the idea that we should decentralize the power of, of, of storytelling authority from the, from the, from the state and, and, and the clergy, right? And it's important to understand that in context, right? Remember that our sense, our modern sense of the importance of individual authority, moral, personal moral autonomy, right? That's a very recent development. Like most people never even imagined that was a good thing or a possible thing. Uh, and, and, and so it makes sense that those people in power would have been afraid of this idea that you might, that you might decentralize centralized uh, uh, intellectual uh, uh, authority. Were they right? Yeah, absolutely. If, you're, if you were committed to maintaining the status quo, if you were committed to the established order of, 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 of hierarchy and power and the organization of the world, then you were totally right to be worried about uh, 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 about the, the the printing press, it's it, it threatened it it threatened everything, right? The, the the point I'm trying to make with these examples is that there's sort of an essential psychological phenomenon about humans, right? We fear our own ingenuity, right? We 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 fear our own capacity to reason. We fear our own consciousness, and I and I put these pictures up here as. Um, as examples of, you know, we've got the Frankenstein and the Terminator, and this is a, a, a still from the 1915 German silent film, uh, Der Golem. Um, 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 the, these, and, and notice that these all come from specific transformation moments, right? Frankenstein at the beginning of the industrial era when it was written, not the movie, when Mary Shelley wrote it, the Terminator during, at the beginning of the computer age, and, and, uh, and, and Der Golem, right, at the beginning of the, of the, of the 20th uh, century. Um, and, and, you know, um, it, it, it seems that we have this fear of ourselves all the, all the time. We recognize that there's a double-edged sword in our capacity for creation. I like to call it the creation destruction paradox, right? Which, which, which not only shows up in our stories, not only shows up the, in the way that we think about, um, the way that we think about technology, but it's sort of inherently in our business theories, right? It's inherently in our notion, you know, the idea that innovation requires disruption, right? Creation and destruction always sort of go together. And even in many of our most beloved developmental educational theories of, of, of children depend on this idea that separation, that fracture, the weaning, you know, that this is a necessary pain on the way to ind independence. This is in psychoanalytic theory and object relations theory, attachment theory, so many of the theories that are at the heart of child development are based on this idea that, that destruction is inherently um, inherently cre creative, right? Even when we talk about, you know, the, the, the need for failure, right? When we talk about the idea of the need for, you know, that you only learn for, for, for failure, that, which this is, this is all because because of the, this same paradox. I think it's a foundational human phobia. Um, and I think it's at the core of what we're gonna need to confront 
if we want to think about the future of education, right? Because, of course, the problem in the world is not the technological progress. It's not the tools. It's not the means within with which we connect to each other. It's that our people are not prepared with the adequate epistemological constitution for a world that is so connected. They're not prepared with, a, with the adequate consciousness for living in a connected world. And I guess that's really the thesis of the talk that I'm going to give today, which is that, or that I'm currently giving, which is, which is that, is that the future of teaching and learning needs to focus on habits of mind for a globally connected world, right? So many people, so often people talk about uh, education in terms of skills, in terms of aptitudes. Um, but I want to argue that the real education is about something much more fundament fundamental. It's about a sense of hospitality. It's about a sense of tolerance and open-mindedness and intellectual humility. It's about the ability to see things from multiple perspectives. And to make this clear, I want to look back at the beginning of education. And I choose to start at Plato's Republic, uh, which was in Greek is Polatia. Um, you know, you, you can make the argument that education starts in lots of different places. I just choose today to make the argument that it starts with Plato's Republic. And I'll make the argument by saying that it's where we get the term academia. Right, um, Plato established his academy. That was the name of it in 387 BC uh, in, in in Athens, and we've been using the term ac academy or academia in relationship to school ever since. But if you read Polatia, if you read Plato's Republic, you discover that his image for education was actually fiercely isolationist. Right, the purpose of Plato's education was to create leaders and guardians who would be aggressive and violent toward outsiders, but not toward members of the Athenian community, right? Um, um, and so the, the point I wanna make is from the very beginning of education, nationalism, tribalism, xenophobia, and prejudice was built in. This is something that we have to reckon, recognize, recognize from the beginning that so much of education throughout time has been, in, it has been designed to distinguish us from them, right? So much of education has been designed to control access to an understanding of languages or affect or etiquette, right? To teach people how to, how to act like they're the insiders, but also how to establish others as outsiders, right? So much of education, so much of our history of education has been, a, has been colonial, right? And therefore inherently about otherness, right? Of course, it claims to eliminate otherness by teaching empathy, but if it's empathy almost always in the language of the colonists, right? Or from the perspective of, of, of post-colonial theorists like Franz Fanon, um, it, it's been about intentionally cementing ideas of otherness into the consciousness of the colonized. Um, throughout history, imperial regi regimes have brought a lot of social, cultural, economic, and technological progress right, like the telegraph, but as we know, these so-called improvements almost always come at a great expense, right? These so-called improvements can be dehumanizing, they can be disrespectful, they can lead to a loss of dignity, and, and, and even where there hasn't been legal apartheid, even when it hasn't been political apartheid, we can't deny that there has always been psychological apartheid, and, and, and it's from this perspective of psychological apartheid that I wanna talk about something that I call the Plato problem. Okay, the Plato problem. Plato, for those of you, I, I, I don't wonder if you call it the same thing in Spain. It's like a little. It's clay that's in color that you buy in a package. I'm sure it's all over the world. Um, I remember when I was when my kids were little, I gave them Play Doh. I gave them colored colored molding clay, um, and they would ruin it very quickly by mixing it all together. Right? They'd take all the colors, they blend it all together, and they'd end up with a gray blob, right? A brown blob, an ugly blob that they just ignore. They just leave it. They didn't want to play with it anymore because it wasn't it it wasn't pretty. And I want to draw a correlation between this and. Um, and, and something that happens on the internet, something that happens in a connected 
world, right? We, what we have essentially done in the world at this point is put so many of us together, so many of us connected in a way where we are rubbing up against each other, where we see each other in a day-to-day -day way. Um, um, but we didn't do that in, in, with, with adequate preparation. So we've gotten something called, that I like to call diversity fatigue, right? The, 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 we live in a new connected context that requires us all to be open-minded, that requires us to be tolerant, that requires us to be respectful respectful of diversity. Um, but in order to do that, we need a fortified sense of self. We need to be able to express our unique selves in a world where the protocols have to be standardized enough to make the connection connection happen, right? So the, the question I'm asking here is how do we allow ourselves to feel unique while also being connected to others and without feeling like a blob of brown clay? Right? Uh, how do we make ourselves have meaning in a world where everything seems to be so mixed together? Unless we start to figure out how to teach our kids this, we can just expect a lot more social, cultural, political upheaval. Right? We're just going to see more of what the world is experienced because uh, because it's the result of this naive empathy altruism hypothesis. Right? We ended up with an enormous amount of connection, but we didn't adequately prepare the the, the children to be able to, 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 to mediate this level of connection, to be able to mediate the tension of togetherness uh, with, without, well, with a fortified sense of health, self, right? It's almost like we, what, like we locked up a bunch of kids in a room together and then we hoped they'd end up hugging, right? We never taught them how to play nicely together. We just assumed that love was so powerful that they'd hug each other in, 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 in the end. And so what happened is that because we didn't teach them to play nice together is that people's individual identities end up expressed in opposition through power struggles rather than through positive autonomous expression of personal agency or autonomy. So how can we manage this better? How can we, how can we do it better? To do that, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to look at a couple Greek words. Um, the two words I wanna look at are, are, are techne, um, that's, that's the one, the, the, the first one, and the second one is episteme. Techne is where we get the word technology. Um, and, um, and, and in ancient Greece, it meant crafts, arts, the kinds of things we make with our hands, hand, handiwork. And episteme meant thoughts or ideas ideas or concepts, the things we create through our capacity for imagining and thinking through, through our capacity for human consci consciousness. And for Plato and Aristotle, both techne and episteme are forms of poesis, right? Which is the root from which we, you see that at the bottom in blue, which is the root from which we get the word poetry, poesis. Poesis, of course, doesn't mean verses. It doesn't mean that you have to write an iambic pentameter. Uh, instead, it means a kind of bringing forth, a kind of expressing a kind of, uh, it has to do with the ways we manifest what is true, right? The ways we express the zeitgeist of, of, of humanity and, and at our core, at our core, humans are makers and thinkers. And so when it comes to learning and child development, it's important that we don't forget that techne and episteme are essentially linked as poesis. They are the same, whether we're dealing with ideas or handicraft, whether we're dealing with hands-on or intellectual, whether we're dealing with praxis or, or theory, they're both forms of, of, of poesis. And that's, that makes perfect sense because I think we all know education, teaching and learning and child rearing, parenting, it's all about bringing forth human consciousness. It's all about teaching young people how to show up, how to live their potential. Um, um, and, and so we always have to have both technological and epistemological agency, both, te both, 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 both handicraft and intellectual uh, agency and autonomy. Education, um, it, 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 education for skills and education for fulfillment, right? Education for vocation and education for, for happiness. And, and to talk about how we make this a reality, I want to talk a bit about learning through play, right? The research, the research is 100% conclusive on this. I'm sure everyone watching this knows play is good. Play is how children develop executive function and self-regulation and social emotional skills. It's how they learn conflict resolution skills. Bottom line, kids just wanna have fun and they learn 
to preserve their fun, right? As soon as there's conflict, they have to figure out how to end the conflict so they can get back to playing. And so they start to manage those social skills out of a purely practical, practical need. Um, but, but if we want to get into the, um, into the sort of science of this, I just, I have a list I took from, from Harvard University Center for the Developing Child that, that just talks about all the things that children practice through play. It is through play that they practice learning, they, they practice focusing and sustaining attention. It's how they learn to set goals. It's how they learn to make plans. It's how they learn to monitor their actions. It's how they learn to adapt to changing conditions. It's how they learn to solve problems. It's how they learn to follow rules. It's how they learn to control their impulses. It's how they learn to delay their gratification, right? Um, um, and by the way, we often talk about playful learning in terms of the youngest children. We often talk about it in terms of, you know, like this small child that's in the, that's in the slide there, but playful learning actually applies to all stages of human development, it, right? It's the same thing that we're talking about when we're talking about hands-on learning, when we're talking about project-based learning, when we're talking about experior, experiential learning, even when we're talking about learning through failure, which is not my favorite semantic Choi, cho choice, we're talking about learning through play. Um, and even when I make a presentation like I'm making right now, even when I present this to you, the more playful it feels, the more fun the slides are, right? The more you're going to get out of it, the more you're going to, the, 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 the more you're going to be able to play with the ideas, right? To play with the frameworks, right? Um, so you, you can talk about this in terms of adults too, but, but I like to talk about it in terms of the youngest kids and the simple, and in terms of the simplest games and toys that they use, because it helps us to remember that all play, all learning, everything we know is situated in, in is always situated in some kind of, of, of context, right? The bottom line is play is not neutral. Play is culturally situated and, and, and um, um, you know, and it usually reflects the normative, political, cultural, technological realities of the adult world, right? So you end up having play that demonstrates the kinds of things that, um, that, that grownups do, right? So, you know, we start to have cars after cars for kids to play with, and we start to have jobs. You see here the, the butcher shop at the bottom here. We start to have certain, we use play as ways to teach our kids the realities of what we expect from the adult world. By the way, this is why we have so many feminist retellings of fairy tales, right? Because they recognize that the, the, the games, even the, even the narrative games that we play with our kids are starting to cement normative ideas, normalized ideas about, uh, about things like gender, right? You know, think about um, um, you know, things like race, you know, all the things that, 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 we, that we worry about, right? So what this should tell us when we think about the idea that play is culturally situated is that while it may be good, and it is certainly good from a learning perspective, there's no essential way of playing that's always been good throughout all of history. The way we play is always, is, is always changing. In fact, play as we imagine it today, the way we would imagine, the way we would see if we see kids playing, if we see them making, if we see them tinkering, that used to be considered very problematic, right? Idleness used to be considered a sin. People used to think kids should be working, that, that you know, maybe if they were lucky, they were allowed to study, but if they were studying, you know, they should study prayer. They should study the Bible. We, we used to believe that kids should spend most of their time working, right? The image that we have now of childhood as a time for self-actualization, as a time for character development, as a time for intellectual growth is unique to the industrial era, right? It didn't exist before that. Uh, um, th this idea that, that we're preparing kids to be playful adults, smart adults, intellectual adults, that childhood is this moment for self-actualization begins with Frederick Froebel's, his kindergarten movement, which happened at the end of the 19th century, right? The end of the 1800, Frederick Froebel's in Germany started the kindergarten movement. And he basically was the first to argue that playful exploration was the best way for young kids to learn, right? And many of the things we take for granted were the result of Froebel's ideas. Actually, many of the things we now call 21st century skills, like creativity and determination and grit and perseverance, right, were new 
moral values of the industrial age that, that Frederick Froebels and his kindergarten movement and people like John Dewey and others, right? They, like Vygotsky, they theorized ways to nurture this, right? They, they, these, they theorized ways to nurture this kind of internal self, you know, self actualization. Um, um, and people didn't like it, right? People didn't think it was disciplined enough. Um, and by the way, I should say that a lot of the conversation in education is, is still sort of reproducing this early debate about idleness versus, work, you know, the, the Puritan work, work ethic, right? You know, um, this notion of rigid, that, that, that our choices are rigidity or freedom, that our choices are testing and worksheets or hands-on experimental learning, that we're either teaching hard skills or soft skills. You know, um, when I hear so many of the people, you know, the TED Talks, like Ken Robinson's TED Talk uh, about industrial era education and the factory model, I actually think they're wrong. I think that most of education has actually been a constant debate, at least for the last 150 years, has been a debate about whether we're going to be in this sort of um, um, playful self-actualization mode, or are we going to be in 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 the in the rigid uh, testing mode. Um, a, a few years ago, while doing research, I found a little book called "The Story of a Sand Pile" uh, by a, by an American psychologist called Stanley Hall. By the way, this is the same person who invented adolescence, um, um, and I mean that like he invented adolescence. He he named it and he wrote a book, a giant book. But we'll, we, I don't need to say much about him. He was talking about this, the the sandbox. The sandbox was new. It was part of the Froebel's. Um, part of Froebel's um, kindergarten movement was the sandbox, and parents didn't like sandboxes. Parents complained that the kids were becoming obsessed with the sandbox, that they were obsessed with this frivolous amusement, that they would go outside and say it's time for dinner and the kids wouldn't stop playing in the sand. They talked about it exactly the same way that parents talk about social media and video games right now. And, 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 and Stanley Hall wrote the book in order to explain that the sandbox has positive psychological and social benefits. Like we had to argue this. Nobody believed it at the time that it had civic benefits, that it had academic benefits. And I, and I love to think about this story because it reminds us that we once had to prove that the sandbox was positive. And that's important because currently, um, be, be, because currently our kids are playing in digital sandboxes, right? In video games and social media and things that seem so superficial to us, so meaningless to us. But those are those things all represent opportunities they have to, to, to practice agency in context, to have autonomy, to have a sense of identity, to have a strong sense of self, even while they navigate the scary diversity, the scary diversity fatigue of the, of, of the inter internet. And since the beginning of video games, it's fair to say that folks have imagined ways of using it educationally, right? Um, Carmen San Diego, Oregon Trail, right? They, they've used it and they've used it because they thought it was engaging, but it's not just about engagement, right? Games are fun for kids because they work like a language, right? They're full of very specific rules, very clear explanations. And that's why kids love them, right? Because because they're always because because they require learning. They require learning the rules. They require trying different things. And 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 the learning in video and kids love learning, right? They love to learn. And the learning in video games is fast and complex and exciting and well engineered. In fact, I have noticed and that all video games are are very similar to have very similar uh, um, things to good teachers. And I use the four R's to explain this: good teaching and good video games are rigorous responsive, reflective, and, and, and real. Rigorous in the sense of, if you think about uh, Vladimir, uh, if you think about Vygotsky's uh, zone of proximal development, which is an educational theory, this idea that there's a space where individual students um, need to in, need, need to overcome things with other people, right? That's what Vygotsky talks about, and the education needs to be always in this place where where that some place between what you can do yourself and what you need others. For video games are the same thing. They always have to be just in the perfect space between easy and hard, right? If they're too hard, you quit. If they're too easy, you're bored, right? It's almost the, almost the same idea. Both video games and good teachers need to be responsive. They have to give clear concise 
feedback. Teachers know they have to give clear, concise feedback. Video games, if you didn't know why you died, you wouldn't play again, right? So you have to be very clear about how your actions are impacting, uh, how, or how, your, how your action, what outcomes you get from actions. You need that feedback. Both good video games and good teachers have to do this. Um, you know, all video games and teachers are, are, are reflective in the sense that they, uh, that they create good metacognition, right? The ability to think about your own thinking, right? And this is what allows, I wrote in the, in, the, in the line here, this is what allows a learner to have a growth mindset. They can recognize from a meta perspective that their thinking is growing. So if I fail a test, I'm still aware of the fact that there's a larger me on a larger, on a larger journey. Same thing is true with video games. In video games, there's always two eyes. There's the eye that is holding the controller and there's the avatar in the game, which is the eye. And of course, both video games and, um, and, and, and um, good teaching are real. I mean, video games are obviously not real, but I use the word real to, 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 to acknowledge the idea of hands-on experiential playful, playful learning, right? It has to be applied. It has to be just like learning. Uh, it has to feel, um, it has to feel like there are stakes. It has to be, you know, otherwise, uh, it, you know, uh, it would be like the, the way we often, if, if you don't have hands-on learning, it's the equivalent of playing a video game I wrote here of trying to understand a video game by reading a manual, but never actually playing, right? They're hands-on and that may, and that makes them, them, them feel real, in, at least in, in, in a sense. Um, um, whenever I talk about this, whenever I talk about uh, the, the relationship between good teaching and good video games, uh, um, I, uh, when, I talk, when I say this to educators or parents, I see them start to have this sort of panic on their face, this sort of what, what I like to call the screen time panic. And I think that's what really scares people, right? It's this fear that apps and games, that social media, that the internet is actually doing a better job teaching than many teachers are, right? But unfortunately, teaching a lot of useless stuff. Right. Uh, unfortunately, teaching the wrong material. Right. And and and, um, um, you know, I, I think I think that's I think that's true. Um, but at the same time, we have the possibility to be teaching very different things in order for us to teach very different things. We need to get over the screen time panic. We need to acknowledge that the screens are here. We need to stop worrying about so many of the things that, that, that we're worrying about and instead, in, you know, throw out what I like to call the on off switch mentality, this idea of how much screen time, how do we limit screen time? Um, uh, how do we, and, and instead start to think about how do we integrate it into our lives? Lives in a greater, a greater, I, greater idea. I mean, in a in a greater degree, right? Um, um, you know, we need to. It's the same as the way we should think about abstinence, ed, abstinence education, right? You don't you don't teach abstinence. You teach more information that allows people to make informed decision. That's what we need to be doing. We need to stop talking about uh, technology and screens in terms of duration, in terms of how much exposure, and we need to start talking about how to make sure that kids get the quality digital experience mentored by adults, mentored by teachers, guided by grown-ups, so that they integrate current technology into their imaginary worlds, into their social lives, into their play. We need to mimic in our classrooms the integration of tech technology as we'd like to see it in the actual world, right? In the end, what I'm basically saying is that to make all of our thinking about technology and global conflict and all the things that are happening working together we need to we need to make sure that that teaching and learning is a is about preparing students with the kinds of habits of mind with the kind of consciousness that they need to participate well in a globally connected world it's about preparing our children again with as i said earlier with a sense of hospitality with a sense of tolerance with a sense of open mindedness with a sense of intellectual humility with the ability to see things from multiple perspectives so that they can do a better job of of living in a world that 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 requires us to confront so much um, otherness.